pattern open seeds. Uh, these aren't men simple Mendelian traits. In fact, uh, there's usually a major gene that controls a lot of the difference and uh, a few minor genes. But it's now also possible when you've mapped a major factor that goes to a particular chromosome region to reach into that chromosome region, sequence the DNA uh, found in an area that's controlling a given trait, identify all of the genes in that region, and try to find the particular candidate genes that may actually be uh, controlling the differences. The conclusion from a bunch of experiments of that type is that single genes make major changes in the course of uh, generating the key traits that have occurred in maize domestication. For example, mutations in a single gene called Tiacente branched 1 can take a single linear-like corn stalk and produce a more bushy plant that looks uh, like Tiacente. Conversely, there's a second gene called TJA1 that plays a key role in seed and fruit case uh, morphology. If you introduce the maize version of the TGA1 gene into Tiacente, those stony fruit cases begin to open up, soften up, you get rid of the stony covering, and you begin to turn the kernels inside out in exactly the way uh, that breeders uh, needed to produce uh, the exposed uh, kernels on an ear of corn. Okay, so I think that's a great example of how by uh, selecting uh, for genetic alterations, you can completely transform uh, the architecture of a plant. How about in animals? And uh, for this example of artificial selection, I'd like to uh, talk about dogs, which I think are a, a wonderful example. Uh, they're introduced in the next uh, short video. So dogs vary in all sorts of interesting traits, colors, hair textures, sizes, behaviors that are interesting and useful to humans. DNA studies suggest that all those different modern dog breeds are uh, derived from wolves. So wolves have lived near humans for thousands of years. In the earliest archaeological evidence of domesticated uh, forms of wolves or dogs is found about 10,000 years ago in human settlements. At that time, the skeletons of domesticated dogs looked fairly uniform and similar to wolves. By the time of the Egyptians, you can see these specialized breeds being developed that have long limbs and long muzzles. That uh, breed actually still lives today in an ancient breed called the Saluki. Other breeds have been developed for hunting, retrieving, herding animals. Pointers and retrievers and sheepdogs are great examples of taking ancestral uh, tracking and hunting behaviors that were present uh, in wolves and turning them in to selected behaviors that are useful for humans. So how is it possible to take an ancestral animal and turn it into this broad diversity of different uh, forms? Let's actually uh, listen to a couple of human dog breeders describe how they look at an animal and how they decide what it is they want to do. I think that his neck is a little bit too short. He's got great strength in the neck, but I'd like to have it just a smidgen longer. Um, I also would like to have a little more muscle definition in the rear. We really enjoy the ability to take the gene pool and use it like paints. It's, it's our art. This is my art. I made this beautiful dog that I enjoy. I made her. I chose her sire and her dam. I chose several generations to make this beautiful dog. I'm very proud of her. Okay, so I think that is a great description of what uh, breeders do. They choose dams and sires. They do so for multiple generations. They pick traits that they're interested in, and they develop animals that look different to match uh, what, what they're interested in. So that process extended by lots of breeders over lots of time, has generated an incredible diversity of uh, different dog breeds that are shown uh, here on this slide. We also have a couple of skeletons from different dog breeds uh, here on the stage. This is actually the skeleton of a German Shepherd, and this is the skeleton of a Boston Terrier. You see all sorts of uh, dramatic skeletal differences uh, between the two uh, dog forms. The most obvious is maybe the, the much longer length of the legs here in the German Shepherd uh, than, than the Terrier. There's also dramatic changes uh, in the jaws. So the muzzle of the uh, German Shepherd is much longer than the short muzzle of the Boston Terrier. If you come at the break, you can actually uh, count teeth. There's more molars uh, in the German Shepherd uh, than found here. The length of the vertebral column also differs. There's twice as many vertebrae in the tail uh, here in the Boston Terrier. So Darwin pointed out that if a paleontologist found these skeletons, he would definitely have named them different species because of the dramatic changes. 
and yet these are examples of Germanic transformations that have been achieved uh, by human, uh, human breeders. Okay, so what's actually happened to transform uh, all of these different skeletal structures? Exactly the same sorts of genetic approaches can be used to study this problem as we introduced for the corn um, tiacente problem. So some very interesting uh, genetic experiments have been done trying to look at the genetic basis of uh, producing skeletal differences. One of my favorite uh, forms of this experiment, because it was one of the largest, uh, was done in the 1920s and 30s by a man named Charles Stockard. Stockard got a big grant uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation and used it uh, to buy a farm in upstate New York. So he called this the Cornell Anatomy Farm, and for about a dozen years he got in uh, all sorts of different dog breeds and carried out interesting crosses to try to look at the genetic basis of form and behavior in dogs. So let's look at some of these crosses. It's a cross that uh, Stockard set up between the German uh, Shepherd and the Basset Hound. Again, the German Shepherd has long legs. Uh, Basset Hounds have short legs. The F1 hybrids of this cross also have short legs. That suggests that there may be a dominant factor in the Basset breed uh, that causes short leg length. If you intercross the F1s and make the F2 uh, grandchild generation, the dogs come out with a mixture of either short or tall legs. And even in the small numbers of animals uh, that were generated here in the dog litters, you can see that short and long legs occur in almost a Mendelian 3 to 1 ratio. Again, a dominant trait, so only a quarter of the offspring show the short legs, or the long legs that are characteristic of the German Shepherd parent. So these sorts of results are consistent with a single Mendelian gene uh, that controls the difference in leg length uh, between uh, these dog breeds. Okay, here's another cross. This one was set up between uh, the Boston Terrier and the Dachshund, the wiener dog. So if you cross these two animals, the F1 hybrid, again, looks intermediate. Looks a little more like uh, maybe the Dachshund than the Boston Terrier. If you intercross the F1s, put the chromosomes together in different combinations, you get very interesting sorts of F2 dogs coming out. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite F2s. It has the tummy blaze of the Boston Terrier. It has ears that are the size and the shape of the dachshund, but they're held in the upright position of the Boston Terrier. <laughs> okay, now, so that already suggests different genes controlling ear shape and ear elevation. But remember something else from the table that we went bore f through before for corn and tiacente. If the traits were controlled by very large numbers of genes, it's almost impossible to get back in a small number of animals any that will show the chromosome types and the traits of the original parents. What's seen here is that very small numbers of animals, you're getting back F2s whose ear shape looks like the dachshund or whose ear elevation looks like the Boston Terrier. And again, that suggests relatively few genetic factors are controlling those different traits. Okay, one last cross. This was one of the more dramatic ones on the Cornell Anatomy Farm. It was set up between the Saluki. So the Saluki is that uh, long muzzle, long limb dog uh, that uh, we showed earlier in the Egyptian uh, photo. This is actually the skull of a Saluki dog. You can see uh, that it has a very long muzzle, much longer than is present uh, in the Pekingese, which of course is a very short dog, very squashed in face, almost no muzzle at all, and very short legs. This was uh, one of the hardest crosses that was tried on the Cornell Anatomy Farm. <laughs> Again, he was able to generate a few F1 hybrids. They look intermediate uh, between the two parents. So if you intercross the F1s, you get some very interesting F2 dogs come out. <laughs> Turns out that the length of the upper and the lower jaw is inherited independently in the cross. So some of the dogs come out with lower jaws that are longer than the upper jaws. Some of the dogs have good match between the upper and the lower jaw, and then this dog in the lower right has the opposite problem. Its upper jaw is so much longer than its lower jaw that it has a constantly uh, protruding tongue. So again, those are very much like the ear results. It's clear that there must be different genes for different uh, traits, so upper jaw genes and lower jaw genes are different. But it's also clear that you can get shorts and longs coming out in a very small number of uh, F2 animals, which again suggests for a given bone, that the number of genes involved are likely to be small. Okay, so a 